Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast for water treaters by water treaters, where we're scaling up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hi, everybody. Trace Blackmore here, the host of Scaling Up. And folks, it was great seeing some of you at the technical training in Las Vegas. I was able to get a few interviews in, get some great questions for future shows. And thanks to so many of you that came up to me and let me know how much this show means to you. I can't tell you how much that means to me. For those of you that didn't make it to the Vegas training, don't worry. You still have one more opportunity to make it to technical training this year. We'll be in Cleveland March 21st through 25th. It's not too late to register, but there are limited spots. So when the spots are are filled up, it will be too late. So go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash TT 2018 to register. I will be there and I hope to see you there as well. Well, folks, he's back. Yes, that's right. Mark Lewis, CWT, is back in the Scaling Up studio to continue our conversation. I must admit that this one's a little bit different than other interviews that I've had on the show. And because of that, I'm really not sure how to introduce it. So I hope you enjoy another segment with Mark Lewis, CWT. My lab partner today is once again, Mark Lewis. Welcome back, Mark. Thank you, Trace. It's an honor to be here again. Uh, I tell you, a lot of positive feedback about you being on the first time, and people said, hey, bring that guy back. We want to hear more from him. Well, you, you know, Trace, when you, when you look at what you've got sitting across from you, it's not hard to, to want more of that. Well, if there's anything that I've learned from having scaling up and having 4,700 listeners, that the listeners out there have very low expectations. So it's understandable that they want to hear back from you. Assuming that they're listening to the host as much as they do, I, I can accept that. Well, fair enough, Mark. Mark, I'm just sort of curious, what have you heard about the show? I know you've been a listener from day one, and I know, and I say this hesitantly because I know you also have some critiques of the show. And when you were here a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned that you and I very easily critique each other because we make each other better. So I am just opening up the microphone. What do you have to say about scaling up? You know, Trace, most people wouldn't do this. I didn't say it was smart. And it's because, you know, I'm going to ask the hard questions and I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the feedback that you may or may not want to hear in front of your public. But but being that you ask, you know, probably the biggest thing that that I hear and, and I feel is is during some of your explanations, your pinks and blue comments, uh, the way you answer questions. You just say, uh, I got this response and, and uh, this question and and um, and this is the answer. And I say, no, Trace. Talk about this. Explain this. Why do you just hit one side of the story? Well, there's a time limit to the show, obviously, so we only have so much time. And when I don't get to talk to the people all the time when they ask me questions. Normally, my questions come from my website, and people will say, hey, I like your show. Answer this question about pH. And that's all I get. So I don't get to dig any deeper other than what they've asked me on the surface. I understand. But, you know, as being a a skilled host that you are, you should be able to cover these topics a little more broader and and address some of these things both ways. And and you and I have a difference of opinion on sure. water softeners. And so when, whenever there's a water softener question, come on, I just have to turn the volume down. <laughs> so, you know, because... I'm very animated and I move my hands and stuff like that. So people, as I'm driving down the road, people will look at me and probably call 911 and say there's a crazy, crazy guy driving down the street. But it's hard because, like you said, the responses that you, you've got to give are, are based upon your knowledge, you know, how you interpret things and how you interpret the questions. Mark, I will tell you that when I am hired to consult with a company, I I don't just answer the question from my point of view and and from the surface. As a matter of fact, their question that they give me leads me to asking them 12 other questions. And I make sure that I understand all the sides around the problem and we're really addressing what needs to be addressed. Unfortunately, with the confines of the show, I don't get to do that. 
I've been trying to think of ways that I could do better with that. And there's some technology out there that allows people to come in and leave a, a like a voicemail message and then I could play them actually asking the question on the show. So I've thought about that a little bit, but I know people are asking me questions that they're comfortable asking because it's anonymous. And sometimes, especially in this business, people are scared to ask the questions they need to know the answers to because other people expect that they would already have the answer to that. Have you thought about on your pinks and blue questions like that, maybe having two sides saying, hey, Mark or, or Bruce or somebody, I've got this question that's come up and this is where I'm coming from. Is there another angle? And, and maybe taking a little time and, and trying to paint a little broader picture? Definitely I can, but that's a, that's a smaller segment of the show. Maybe as this show evolves, maybe I have a spinoff show where I'm just answering questions. Well, I tell you what. How about you put your money where your mouth is, and when we're done with this interview, how about you come back and you answer Pinks and Blues with me? That would be the most well-received Pinks and Blues question series you'd ever have. I guess we'll see. <laughs> I guess so. But, but Trace, you know, some of the, as we, as we have these questions, you know, you introduced scaling up as a concept back in, I know we were talking about it last February or March and so, and I think one of your first episodes was somewhere in April. And, um, you know, my question to you is, is where do you find time to put together this show like you do and still do everything else you do? Well, I've, uh, I teach time management, and that doesn't mean I have any more time than, than anybody else. But by teaching something, as you said when you were here last time, you, you get to know it a little bit better. And what I have found is that everything you do is a choice. And you have to choose where you're going to spend your time. And if you say, yes, I'm going to do this one thing, by default, you're saying, I am not. I'm going to say no to this other thing. And I am very careful when I commit to do something. And that being said, I tell people no a lot. They say, hey, we need you to write this article for this or whatever it is. If it doesn't fit into uh, where I need to be spending my time, I will delightfully and thankfully tell them no. But that's because there's a bigger yes that I'm saying yes to. So this show I found was a bigger yes as you can tell from the show, I'm extremely passionate about the water treatment industry. From our previous conversation, we talked about how a lot of water treaters either don't understand this industry, they don't give it the respect that it deserves, and a lot of times that leads to them misleading customers. Maybe that's intentional, maybe it's not. And I want to take away the excuse that there's no place where somebody can go and easily find good information about water treatment. And at the very least, I want to make sure that all those good water treaters out there that could be great water treaters, I'm that slight nudge. This show is a slight nudge. The guest that I have on is that slight nudge that allows them to continuously get better. So like You've heard several times a rising tide raises all boats, but how awesome would it be if we were just competing with other water treaters that were treating this industry with the respect like you and I have? Well, I'll say that, you know, my years on the board, you know, people do have requests and they pull you aside and they say, hey, the AWT needs to do this, the AWT needs to do that. And one of the things is that we challenge, and you, this is one of the things that you've mentioned for the reason is we have so much windshield time that if we could listen to the TRTM, okay? And so we took that response. Or we and took and that by the way, for the listeners out there, that's the AWT's technical reference and training manual. So, so as the board, we were trying to figure out how do you take that information and put it on an audio version when there's so many graphs and charts and pictures that we referred to. And, and we really determined that it probably wasn't that feasible to, to make all that. So, so this show does go in and, and kind of meets one of those needs. In a past episode, Mark Vermeulen was saying that his drive may be as short as two hours, may be as long as eight. You're here in Atlanta. You can take two hours to go 15 miles down the road. I have my territory um, 
I put a two hour time limit either way from my house that I'm gonna work because if I'm at one end of my territory, a customer has a problem, I'm four hours away and that's a long time if someone needs me. So I don't go way out, I, I try to stay centralized. So this program is meeting a huge need for a lot of, of water treaters and, and we're passing a lot of good information. But you know, with the dedication to put on this show, I'm sure that you've had to incur a little bit of cost and you've kind of absorbed that because of your passion for our industry to teach other people to be better water. That just doesn't make sense. How do you how do you respond to that? Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people just don't get it. And, and I'm going to be the first to admit that I'm just not wired right. Here's the fact. Uh, I am who I am, and I am a water treater. My father raised me to be that way. He taught me to respect this industry. He taught me to build this industry up to leave it better than I found it. My father, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago. And without a doubt, Ray Blackmore left the water treatment industry better than he found it. So a little bit, this is uh, in, in memory of my father because uh, I'm able to reach more people on a larger scale where he was just really able to, to reach me, teaching me to be a better water treater and the people that he came in contact with. Well, Trace, I'll say there's no bigger honor to, to honor your father with a show like this. And, and with that being a driving force or a motivator for you, you touched it. Uh, you know. Well, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a reason. You mentioned that the AWT um, was looking for a way to read the TRTM. And oh my gosh, I can't imagine a more boring document to listen to. But I was thinking, okay, well, if we are spending this much time behind our windshields, what could I do to entertain people as they are learning? And to back up to what you mentioned on, on the show you were on before, you learn things better when you teach them or when you talk about them. So I think it's great that I've got a platform where I can invite guests on the show that know so much more about topics than I do. And now I'm getting educated right along with all the other listeners and I'm a better water treater because I'm hosting this show. So I did this to, to give back to the industry that I truly love. I did this to selfishly to make me a better water treater in the industry that I'm involved in. And, and you're right, I, um, I did decide that I was gonna pay for this 100% because you know, nobody else was doing it in the beginning. And, and I'm assuming you were alluding to the question that I asked several months ago where I was wondering if the audience how would they would feel about the show content if I were to take sponsorships? Is that what you were alluding to? Well, just anytime you do something and do it well, there's there's always a cost. And, and most people say, okay, I'm willing to make this investment for this return down the road. And so, you know, and, and I know your heart, I know your passion, and, and I know what you're trying to do. Uh, my, the question is, is, was why? Why would you make this this investment in both financial terms as well as time, just with a, a vision to make the industry better than it was before. That, to a lot of people, that just doesn't make sense. And so... I find uh, a lot of motivation knowing that I can be that nudge, as I mentioned before, that makes a good water treater a great water treater. Or maybe it's not even a water treater. I know there's a lot of people that listen to me that aren't in the industry because I have other topics on. So maybe I motivate them to do something more than they actually would. That means that means a lot to me to be able to be that nudge. So while we're talking about the show, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask two questions and I'm going to give you a little time. I'll ask the first one and give you time to think about it while I'm kind of setting up the by, second By the way, how, how did tables turn? How are you asking questions now? Because I'm older. I'm the elder. I should be in charge. All right. Well, you are old. You, you know, and I will say that... Um, uh, you know, as the, as the higher CWT exam score, I should be the one in charge. Angela did not confirm or deny that, I guess, if you Well, you know, when, when I took the exam, Angela Pike was not around. It was, it was prior to, and, and therefore I can make that comment, and Angela cannot dispute it. So as the higher score of the exam. I, I will say that you have a lower number than I do. So your your number is? 98. Okay, and I'm 182. Twice as better. I'm twice <laughs> as good as you are. So I guess my, my two-part question is, I want you to think about uh, all the feedback that you received on the show. And, and what has been the one comment 
that has made you proud and said, yes, this, this is the reason why I do this. This is the why I, I reach out to these people and I ask them and I invite them onto the show. And then at the same time, what's a comment that you've received that's caused you to think about, I'm doing this in a positive mode. Okay. What comment have you received that has caused you to think about maybe doing something a little different? So in other words, for those in Rio Linda, what has been the worst feedback that you've received? The worst feedback. All right. Well, uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned probably my favorite comment on an earlier show where Andy Morcom, CWT, called me and said one of his competitors called him, heard him on the show, congratulated him for getting his CWT and said, I want to buy you a beer so we can talk about it. And he said before this show, that conversation, that phone call would have never happened. So this show is acting as a catalyst for us to break through the fact that we are competitors, but not competing against each other. We're now understand each other because we're going through the same thing each and every day. So that's probably my, my biggest comment, my biggest positive comment I got back. At the end of the year, I've got one more. So at the end of the year, I did the CWT challenge. And I was really shocked when I had Andy Morcom and Andy Williams on and they told me their CWT numbers and they just got their CWTs and they weren't that much higher in numbers as they were 300 and something. So that tells me we don't have a lot of CWTs and I don't understand that because that is the, the highest designation that you could have in this industry. And as being as somebody that cares about this industry, I would think that, you know, everybody who's in it would want to get that designation. So I decided that I was going to try to talk about it as much as I could, talk about all the great things that I've had happen to me because I was a CWT. And I started that CWT challenge and I have received not quite a hundred yet, but I have received, I want to say it's in the sixties where people have downloaded my five tips and they've commented that they are going to start studying so they can pass the certified water technologists. Well, I'll tell you, um, and I know you've said some of these same comments about the CWT. The one thing that uh, the CWT has done for me is that it does, it's not only that, that I say that I know the information, but it also allows my customers to understand that Mark is serious about this water treatment stuff and such that he's gone out and received a certification, a designation about his his abilities to treat water. So I know we talk about it a lot, but we see these things in bid specs sometimes. We see them um, where just some, sometimes when you're explaining yourself, you know, who you are, what you've done, how long you've been in the industry. You know, and the thing that I like to say is, is are you a water treater with 15 years of experience, meaning that for 15 years you've been gaining experience, or are you a water treatment that's just been in the industry doing the same old thing for 15 years? So you have 15 one year worth of experience or do you have 15 years of experience? And I think that's what the, the CWT does because early on when we were putting this program together, one of the challenges we had, it was, okay, someone with five years in the, in the field and, and it, we, we changed that to someone that has applied themselves for five years in the field. So we, we kind of up the, the criteria there just a little bit. Well, you asked me another question. You right. asked me what the what the worst was. And, and I, I got to tell you, Mark, the, the feedback that I've got has, for the most part, been very, very positive. A lot of questions I get around the question that you asked me earlier that people just don't get it. You know, what's what's in it for you? Why are you doing this? Why are you paying for this show? You know, why do you invest all that time? And, you know, I, I answered that question to, to why I'm doing that. But that, that's probably the biggest the biggest question that I get. I, I wouldn't say I've gotten any truly negative comments. People say, oh, I really want you to talk about this or you didn't you didn't speak enough on on this topic when you answered Peaks of Blue. Well, heck, you just did that. Well, I, I know that you have stated several times that, uh, you know, sometimes you're slow to get your guest on. And I know that's a comment that I've heard. You know, it's taken you almost a year to get Mark Lewis on this show. <laughs> and, and, and why it has, I don't know. 
Scheduled conflicts, I guess. I, um, I guess that has been the worst comment that I have received. That uh, Multiple is, emails, I, yes. I think. I don't know how you forget that. Yes, that, that is true. There, I have there, them on my sent. Yes, folder, yes, you know. yes. There, there, there was one, one particular listener. I won't say who it was, but they were complaining that Mark Lewis was not on the show quicker than you actually were. So I'll answer the question that way. Okay. So anyway, we, we got to talk about the good and the bad to exactly. get better. So, exactly. So, so with that in mind, as, as, we're, as we move forward, what are some of the topics that you would like to have discussed on? Have you thought about kind of where you're going and planning out to where, or do you find it better just to, to invite people and, and talk about, do, do you have specific topics? Is that where you get your people from? Or are you just trying to get good people and share what they're not, share their knowledge. So I would say yes and no. When I started the program, I had a, and I still do, I have a, an Excel sheet of all the questions that I've ever been asked during training. Not all the questions, but a, a good a good amount of them. And that's why I started the show because I just simply didn't have enough time to answer all of them when I was at the training. And I thought, hey, what a great show to have. We have so much windshield time, I could start answering those questions. And then uh, I'm a big fan of dirty jobs and Mike Rowe always asks people, you know, please tell us what your dirty jobs are because if you don't, I'm out of a job. So I'm always asking the listeners to let me know what they want to hear about. And those are the shows that I, I, I really like doing because I know I'm spot on. I'm talking exactly to the people that want to hear exactly what they want to hear. So please, by all means, listeners out there, continue to send me in your questions because that ensures what I'm going to talk about. And then if there are any lulls in there, I'm pulling from that other list. And I'll also say that, you know, there's, there's times when there's topics that just an audio version doesn't do that topic justice. And so those are some of the Are things. you going to ask me about video? No, 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 no. That's, I've, I see you. This is a radio voice. It is not. <laughs> it is not a, a, a audio or a TV face. So we are. We're not going there. But you know, I will say that you know some of these topics are concepts or ideas. Just like reading the technical reference and training manual wasn't a good idea because you had to reference back to things. There are things where that are taught at the technical training or at the convention because that's a better format. Sure. And so. We may be limited on some of the things we can talk about. I, I will say that I get a lot of feedback from the math class that I do for technical training. And people that are listeners of the show that have been to the math class said, well, you said you're doing this show to broaden what you're able to talk about at the technical training on this show. Why don't you do that with math? And you know I'm a math geek and I, and I love all that stuff. And I don't just like to do the math. I like to prove where those equations come from. So now the people that are running those equations can truly understand if their answer makes sense or not. I would love to do that on the show, but I can't imagine how incredibly boring that show would be. So uh, if any listeners out there have any ideas to how I can do some math shows or something like that, that's definitely something that... I'd like to get some feedback on. Well, and I think that's a very difficult to do with with this audio version. But, you know, um, I, I don't want to just talk about the show. I do want to talk about some technical terms or <laughs> some, some, t some technical topics. And, you know, one of the things that, that we deal with a lot of times um, are, are closed loops. And, and I know that when I was a new water treater and I was given a list of accounts, I had a number of systems that were just closed loops. Go out there, run the test, write the report, and learn how to do service. Yeah, your boss figured they're, they're smaller accounts. You can't mess up a closed loop how, too bad. How do you mess up a closed loop? But, but as I've been in the business for a number of years, that closed loops because not only do people think of it, oh, it's a closed loop. It doesn't lose water. It doesn't have problems. It's not going to scale. It's not going to do this. It's not going to do that. I think that what I'd like to talk about a little bit is closed loops from okay. a standpoint of when you're looking at closed loops, what are some of the things that, that you like to do or the equipment that you like to have on it? And, and I know that some of the things that you spoke about earlier before the show, you and I, okay. uh, have, have kind of caused me to start doing some things, and I'm amazed. As you look at a closed loop on a, on a building, uh, what are some of the things that you see that people just forget to do? Well, I, I will say, and, and James McDonald, I think this was his pet peeve as well when he was on the show, 
What well, closed loops are the most neglected system in the entire water treatment portfolio. And if you think about what our job is, we are heat transfer efficiency managers. Our job is to make heat transfer from a place that we don't want it to a place where we don't care about it as efficiently as we can possibly make that happen. All the other bells and whistles that we do, that's just because we're heat transfer efficiency managers. And if you look at the entire system, that includes the cooling tower, that includes the boiler, that includes all the closed loops. We have to make sure that those systems are operating at their top efficiency or we can't be heat transfer efficiency managers. We're not being good jobs at it. So when I look at water treatment, uh, I, like to, I like to envision a stool. And, and it's a four-legged stool and the stool has these four legs that are equally separated apart on the four sides, if you will, of the stool. I, I never get things out of my head through my mouth very well, so I hope that makes sense. Anyway, so water treatment is sitting on top of the stool and these four legs represent the four areas of water treatment. Well, one is corrosion. We're making sure that we're making things corrode at a rate that's acceptable within the industry. The other one is scaling. Typically, you don't have to worry about too much scaling in the closed loop because it doesn't cycle up, but I have seen it happen. So by all means, you need to treat for it. Microbial fouling, the bugs that are growing in the system. And then the, the last leg is, is the dirt and debris, the items that are coming in with the system. And that's, that's the one that I probably want to discuss the okay. most because I know for years you put a shock feeder and you, you test it. And if the water gets dirty, you flush it out and you, and you retreat it. And it's not something that's going to happen very often unless you have just a dirty system. A number of years ago, uh, after a conversation we've had, I've started putting filters on my closed water systems. And I am amazed at the color discoloration, I guess you could call, of the filters that come out of closed water systems with perfectly crystal clear water. Sure. It's like, where does this stuff come from? And and so that is one of the things that I've learned that, you know, when you, to properly treat a system, you want to remove the contaminants from the system as much as possible because if they're in the water, they're going to get onto the surfaces of the pipe, of the tubes, et cetera, and they're all going to reduce heat transfer. And so what was your first experience to, to knowing that, hey, I've got to put filters on these closed loops in order to handle part of this stool? Well, again, I learned a lot from my father, and my father was the one that taught me those four pillars of water treatment. And he would say, you know, we're missing the boat on the, we're doing it on the cooling tower if we had a sand filter, but we're missing the boat on the closed loop because we just have a pot feeder. We don't have a filter feeder. And if we're not uh, filtering out all those contaminants, all that dirt and debris that's in the system, then we're not able to do our job and we don't have a complete water treatment program. And, and I don't want to go too deep into this conversation because some of the information that we, we do cover, um, we go into deeper details in technical training and the fundamentals and applications. So course. we're not going to talk about it here because we want to get people a technical training. We want to do primers. Okay, got it. We, got we, it. Want, to, we want to encourage you enough to spark a, uh, an idea to turn on a, a dimly lit light bulb so that you are inspired to say, you know, I would love to go to technical training this year. And the reason for that is, is I want to learn the next level of of closed loops of, of chillers of towers of boilers etc and and so sometimes it's it's how do you ask the question you know can i go well so, i'll tell you what i'll wrap up that section so i don't give too much away because i know we talk about this in fundamentals and application but one of the things we do talk about in fundamentals and application is water is just an outstanding heat transfer medium there, there's nothing better than water at absorbing heat and transporting it to, to somewhere else without it itself getting, getting warmer. Well, water is that way. Other substances aren't. So if we have water with all these other substances that are, you know, clinging around to the water, that's not allowing the water to do its job as efficiently as it possibly can. And then when we finally get down the road and that stuff settles out of the system, that heat has to transfer not just from the water through that heat transfer surface, but also through all that settled out dirt and debris. So if we can put a filter feeder in that, then we are making the system more efficient. 
Absolutely. And, and that's just, that's part of it. So it's, it's part of how these, these little things can ultimately end up being larger issues down the road. And, and what we want to do is, as water treatment professionals is we want to prevent those things from ever happening. So Trace, as we look at filtration and, and filtering all that stuff out, you know, one of the things that, that I think that, that's a big failure in, in treating systems is not really realizing what you're treating for in these closed loops. And so if you're treating a system that's been treated in the past, how do you address properly treating that system differently than you have a system that hasn't been treated? What are some of the issues with the different treatment programs? Because when you look at treatments for closed loops, you have nitrites, you have silicates, you have molybdates, you have all these different commonly used treatment programs. How do you determine which one is the proper treatment program and, and what issues happen if you mix programs together? It's a question that I don't think that can be answered with a blanket statement. I think each system, you have to realize uh, what the history of that system is. But let, let's say, for example, that it's a brand new system. You're taking it over from the start. You can pretty much do whatever you want to with that thing. As long as you've got some checks and balances to make sure that your program is working, you're probably going to be fine. And those checks and balances would be corrosion coupons. And yes, I put corrosion coupons on closed loop systems. However, and this is where we get called in a lot because uh, people are doing a great job treating the cooling tower, but they're not doing a good job treating the closed loops. And now they're having problems at the air coils, the fan coils themselves, and they're leaking or they're clogged up or something like that. So with that, you probably need to realize that the system might be a little bit in worse shape than, than you realize and being very aggressive to try to clean all that stuff off might be a great idea and it might be a horrible idea. So I'm a little hesitant to talk about use this chemistry for this and that chemistry for that, although we can if you want to, but I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather answer that question with, you know, most everybody has a core product that they know very well how it works. And hopefully from your last question, everybody's gonna put a filter feeder on that closed loop. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just bring up that, that I think that, that there is no right answer for every system. Mm -hmm. each, each system is, has its own issues. Um, but, but going from a brand new system, I would agree. Pick your poison, pick whichever program type program you want to go and, and properly treat and get that system off running the way that, that it should be. As you, as you start with programs that have been treated one way or the other, you know, you do have to determine, well, what's the condition of my system? Yeah. What are my issues? What is going to happen if I break loose stuff that's sure. in this system? Because what I have to do as a, as a water treatment professional is, is I have to tell my customer everything that might happen mm -hmm. so that there's no surprises. Yeah. And what, what I'd like to add to that is that we've now installed this filter feeder before we do some, some major cleaning project or, or, or make any of those recommendations. That filter is going to tell us a lot about what's going on in that system. We're going to be able to examine what's coming out of the system, how much is coming out of it. And then when we move from our preferred treatment program from whatever was used in the past, we're going to see the effect of that in that filter bag as well, their filter or however, whatever filter media that you're using. And, I, and I'll just say that in, in our previous show, we talked a lot about uh, understanding your chiller, how your chiller works. Every one of those values that you pull off of the condenser you can also pull off of the evaporator. There is an evaporator approach, and the approach is the difference of the, the water temperature. This one is the water temperature leaving and the, the refrigerant temperature. And so there is a, uh, an approach, a difference in those temperatures. And, and you, you're looking more for a trend. You know, you're not always looking for zero. You're not always looking for one or two. It's all specific to that machine. But as that approach spreads apart, something is caused that reduction of, of heat transfer. And, and what our job is, is to understand why. And so when you see this initial cause, it's, it causes more concern for additional testing to see what's causing that. And if everything's good on the water side, is it, could it be something on the, on the mechanical side? And, and I'm telling you that, that you're a hero 
when you're able to tell someone that they need to look at something and they can schedule it rather than downtime. And that's been probably one of my, my largest uh, accolades through the, through the years is, is how did you know that? Okay, and it's because I'm observant and I look at all parts of the system. Mark, to allude back to the conversation that you were referring to earlier, where you said you started using filters in your feeders, that's what you said. You said you could start seeing differences in how your chiller was working because you're getting all that crud out of the system. Yeah, and, and you know, we as water treaters, normally about annually, we get to look at the condenser side of things. And, and, and I think inspections are something that we haven't covered that deeply. Uh, so we'll talk about that on our next little uh, uh, question here. But, but what we have to do is we have to be doctors. We run these tests to determine what's going on inside of a system. And so when we do get the opportunity to look inside of a chiller, we've got to take advantage of it. So as we move into an inspection, what are some of the tools that you have at your disposal or that you use to, to look at the results of your water treatment program going as you... Well, great question. We actually have a, a toolkit that we take on, on inspections. And if you would have told me you were going to ask that, I would have had it in here. But I think I can go through it mentally what's in there. Definitely a camera so we can take pictures of what we see right there that day. But we also take, uh, and normally this is on our iPad, we have last year's pictures and possibly the year before those pictures so we can put today's pictures in context with what we're looking at. We already know where the problem issues are going to be before they even open up that chiller bill. I've got, uh, of course, a couple of different flashlights uh, in there. I've got a really bright flashlight and then I've got some real skinny flashlights so I can look inside tubes. Can't look too terribly far with a flashlight, but you can look a little bit in there. I've got a putty knife so I can remove some of the tubercles and see if that is a fresh corrosion cell or if that's a very old corrosion cell that's been arrested and things are looking well. And then with the previous company, I had a, access to a $30,000 boroscope. And I, whenever I had a chiller inspection, I would get them to ship that puppy to me and I would look into it and you know just be able to document it and put that on a video and those in those days it was vhs now of course we just make everything an mp4 but uh you and i have spoken that there's some very inexpensive tools that doesn't give us the thirty thousand dollar quality but it does give us a nice look inside the tube so we can at least see what's going on and you were actually the one that turned me on to that, so. I heard of a fellow coworker of mine who went into a facility and he was taking care of one system and, and they were looking at another system, was asked to come over and look. And the question came up, well, what's down inside the tube? And because my associate wasn't aware this inspection was gonna take place, the engineer went and got what they call an endoscope. And you think of endoscopes in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. But basically what this was, it was a, uh, endoscope that was it was 15 foot long, five meters, and it plugged into a wireless transmitter and a light source. And so you could turn the light on. It gave you light at the end of the the camera, very rigid, so you could it would hold its shape, and and you were able to wirelessly connect to your phone, and then with the app on the phone, you actually got to see exactly what was at the end of the camera. Now, normally, like you said, thirty thousand dollars, and I think our first one was a refurbished unit where that was like twenty grand. I think we ordered this thing, and it was under forty bucks um, with a case for for everything, and and it's it's ten eighty p quality. It's I, I'm very impressed with the the quality that I see out of it. So when you do an inspection, you do need to have things available so you can actually see what's going on in the system. So this has been something that, that I think I went, I didn't even ask my company to buy it. I just bought it, it's, it's mine, it sits in my car, and I'm just impressed with it. So, uh, and you've tested it out and it works. And I think you've actually purchased one as well. Yeah, we, we've used it on a couple of inspections, and you're right, it's not the $30,000 model. 
But without it, you can't see any length within the tube, so it gets you some more information. Yeah, normally you can stick your finger in and, mm-hmm. and twirl and get the first, you know, two inches of feel to see if there's any slime in there. And I don't know about you, I'm a, I'm a big guy, so I got big fingers, and and they don't go very far in there. But you know, you get you get an idea. But the um, having a visual all the way down through a tube or, or down into a boiler, you know, looking into a boiler, you see the tubes right in front of you. Um, and what we have today in digital cameras and such are so much better than what we've had in the past because if you've ever done an inspection with a mirror and a flashlight, it's funny when you see some of the older bowler inspectors. No, oh, I've got one of those in our bag, by the way, one of those mirrors on a stick. Telescopic yeah. folds and, and, you know, they'll take the flashlight and shine in to get light around and, and you can't see that much. But uh, even a digital camera, uh, you know, one of the most important things I'll re- tell people to do is, is put the strap on your hand if you, if you, Break that plane with, with any part of the, the camera so that you don't drop your camera in, in, into a boiler. And I'm sure, just like me, you have dropped a camera into a boiler. No, I can't, I, I can't say that, but I have. <laughs> so I got it out. It wasn't fun, but yeah, that strap is there for a reason, folks. It, it is. So the uh, But inspections are something that's probably a, a, be a show on their own, and there's people that are much smarter than I that I would ask you to... To, to hold that show with and uh, so but just some of the quick items that I would say is uh, you got to be able to see you got to have light uh, you got to have something that you can reach down into the the piece of equipment that you're you're looking at to see what's going on and you got to be able to record so cameras if phones make it just so easy to do all those things these days they do there's just no strap on them that's my, that, this is that's true. my biggest concern <laughs> with using my phone is is no straps so well mark what i will do is i know you like this endoscope pretty well and we've used it a couple times and have gotten some good results with it so i'll put an affiliate link on my show notes page it will be scaling up h20 forward slash scope and if you want to check it out it'll be an amazon link there and then um and how i don't know if i explained to the audience or you affiliate Affiliate links are if you were to buy something off an affiliate link and say it was 20 bucks, if you buy it off of Amazon or my affiliate link, it's just going to cost you 20 bucks, but Amazon pays me a little bit of commission since I advertised it. So I'll make sure that that's up on the scaling up notes page. And I'm curious to hear what other people have to say about it. You know, all of us use tools and our, to do our job. And the only way we all get better is, is to share these concepts or these items that we use. And so that's, that's why this show is here is to tell you what we're doing to become better water treaters. And in return, we're, op- we're just asking that, that everyone shares. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what some of the tools that people are using out there in the Scaling Up Nation. Previously, we shared the light that we use in our test kit and gotten a lot of positive feedback about that. I think you use that light. Do you, is that a light that you use? No, I don't use that light. Okay, I thought you did. No, but I do l- use litmus paper just because I think it's a good indication. No, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't know where you were going with that. Well, you know, just I know that several shows have been about pH and things like that. I thought I'd have a little fun. You know, I get so many questions on pH and alkalinity. I think that's the most misunderstood topic in the water treatment industry. So that, that's why I do so many shows on those. Well, when, when you think about it, you know, if you actually, if you Google pH probe and then read the concept of One of the first years uh, that we did fundamentals and application, I handled the testing section. Yeah, I think you told people how to build a pH meter if I... Well, I went through and I explained each of the different parts because uh, if you don't understand it, if if you let the pH electrode dry out, if you see this, if you see that, you did a great explanation in your podcast about explaining when to calibrate, when to replace a probe. Don't be afraid to to replace a probe. I mean, because... You're there one day a month, two days a month looking at things. That system runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and and you're not always there. And so when you are there, you've got to make sure that you're getting the best data available. So, uh, you know, Trace, you always kind of end your shows with with a lightning round question. And I think, I don't think you've ever answered those. So if you were going to tell your listeners the last three books that you've read, what, what would you tell them? Well, I love reading. I, I get a lot of information from reading and I like to I like to turn around. That's one of the motives for me asking that question. I want to know what my next book is going to be. And I like to figure out how am I going to apply something or some things from that book in how I do business or, or something that's going on in my life. So I wasn't prepared to answer this, so I need to think back. The book that we just finished reading with my business group was The Advantage by Pat Lencioni. 
Pat Lencioni is a, a business author. He's a consultant. He consults and makes teams better teams. And he's written books. Probably the most popular one is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And he talks about the five things that a, a team needs to do in order to work well together. And those are things like uh, they've got to trust each other. They can't have fear of conflict. If I'm in fear of being in conflict with you, then I'm not going to tell you something the team needs to hear. And then once everybody gets everything out on the table, we're then able to commit to what we're able to do. And then we're going to focus on attention to detail and the results. And I'm, I'm missing one of those on the top pyramids. But anyway, it's about how to get the team together. And he's written a dozen books or so around topics like that. So the advantage is the condensing of all 12 of those books oh. into sort of the summary of what you need to know from that. So it was The Advantage by Pat Lencioni. Um, I had uh, Captain David Marquet on the show. I remember. And I reread his book to make sure that I was intelligent uh, enough to ask him some questions. So that was in there. And I'm looking at my bookshelf to see what was the last one that I read. And oh, it was The Machine. The Machine by uh, Justin Roth Marsh. And what he did, he looked at the sales part of a company, so the sales organization, and sort of retooled it and said, let's not look at it the way we always look at it. Let's look at it if we were building a product. I actually have him as a guest on the show. He'll be on later this year. He'll do a much better job of explaining it, but I wanted to make sure I could interview him properly. So I read those books. So those are the three. No one will ever make a movie about you. Of course not. But but you will probably do that because you find these things entertaining and, and such, and you like to hear yourself speak. So when you make a movie about your life, who will play you? Well, I, I tell you who I would like to play me, and he would in no way accept that script, and I'm sure. And we would also have to get into the DeLorean to go back in time because it would be a younger Gene Hackman. I think he is just an incredible actor. Not that we look alike or anything, but I just think that he is uh, he's fantastic. Trace, what would you tell Trace Blackmore on day one if you could go back and talk to him today? All right. I've asked that question several times. So it's hard for me to pinpoint when my first day of water treatment is. I think I told the story that my first water treatment memory is me burning my hand on my father's hot plate when I was actually in the mechanical room when I was five years old. And he was servicing an account. By the way, I don't recommend that. So I'm not sure when my first day was, but if I were able to figure that out, I would tell myself, pay attention to this man. You know, he's your dad and, you know, you go through a time in your life that, you know, you think they don't know anything and, and you know way more than they ever will. And then, of course, you come to a period in your life where you realize, wow, they knew a lot and I really should have paid attention. But I never really thought of a time that I wasn't going to have my dad as a resource to ask water treatment questions to. So to tell myself, you know, write books, take notes, do whatever you need to do, get all the knowledge out of this man's head because it will help you moving forward. That's probably what I would tell myself. Great. And, and just so that, you know, I'm always trying to one up you, you know, you normally ask three light round questions. I'm going to ask four. And so the last and final question I'm going to ask is, is if you could go back in time and have a conversation with someone, who would it be and why? One of my heroes through history is Winston Churchill. And if you look at all the things that were going on through that time, people were not helping him fight the evil powers that he was going up against. Uh, it would be interesting to talk with him and, and figure out how he, how he stayed the path that he did, how he rallied support and how he truly was the catalyst that allowed the Allied forces to, to stop the evil that was going on. Well, now it's time for Pinks and Blues. So as promised, Mark Lewis has stuck around and he's going to help us answer some of the questions that you and the Scaling Up Nation have written in and asked me to answer on the air. So, uh, Mark, you ready to help me out with this? Sure. All right. We already spent the first half of the show telling people that I normally do this wrong. So hopefully you can, you can, you can correct that issue. Well, fire away. 
All right, so our first question from a listener, how do I know if my chiller is scaled? And Mark, I can't think of a better question to ask because you're here and as everybody knows, you're the chiller whisperer. So I would, I would say that the, the first thing that you would notice is that you would be recording temperatures from the user interface on a regular basis and you're seeing that those numbers are not consistent, that they are changing somehow. They are changing and, and they're changing more than just from uh, load factors. And so what, you know, one of the things you should always record is the chiller approach. Chiller approach is the temperature of the water leaving the condenser barrel and the temperature of the refrigerant leaving the condenser barrel. So your, your liquid leaving, uh, going back to your economizer versus the water going back to the tower. And, and so that's, that's the first indication you're going to have. You know, and there's a difference here, scaled and fouled. Fouled is any type of heat transfer impediment to where uh, scaled is actually mineral buildup on the on the tube. And it could be microbial buildup as well. Could be, could be. So as we're looking at this, because you're always logging your chiller to see what the chiller's doing, you got to understand, we're treating the chiller. Okay, now most people say we're water treatment experts, okay? We treat the water that cools the equipment. So we need to understand how our equipment operates, which is our chiller. And, and so by understanding that, we're treating the water to cool the equipment. So by running the test to see where our tests are, we know what the water is doing in the system. And then what we've got to do is determine, is that chiller operating like it should? So uh, chiller approach is probably the, the biggest one that we look at. The other one is if you're not able to get your temperatures down in the building, if, if the machine is working as hard as it can work and just can't get temperatures down, uh, get an indication of something's going on. A lot of people say, oh, well, my tower's not scaled up. My chiller m must not be scaled. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I see no deposits here, so there shouldn't be any there. And, and what we have to remember is that the big difference in the two is temperature. We have all the heat down in the in the condenser barrel. We have less heat up in the in the cooling tower. So uh, we're all going to scale our condenser barrel first. And if we've got any deposits in our tower, we can bet we've got them down in our chiller. But uh, so I would check, you know, approach. I would check water temperatures. Uh, I would listen. A, a scale chiller will will scream uh, louder than normal. Uh, maybe even will surge. Um, but you know, some of the things that, that we have to understand is there's other factors that will give an indication that a chiller is scaled. Low refrigerant, air in the refrigerant, uh, low water flow, the water is too hot. And so we've got to understand and, and determine if we have something outside of whack, it's going to point to a scaled chiller. And so we, we do have to understand there's many components that will make our chiller look scaled when it's actually not. There's a mechanical issue that's causing our problem. And in, in the fundamentals and application, we talk about the difference between chemical problems and mechanical problems. And we can't fix either with the other. We've got to address all of our chemical issues chemically, our mechanical issues mechanically. That's a great answer. And I have stolen that phrase and used on this show many a time. The person didn't ask this, but I'm going to throw it in, but how would you know that your boiler is starting to get fouled? And that would just simply, I think you said it very well with the chiller, you're not going to take one reading and know anything. But if you're, every time you're going in there and you're recording the information and you can see what the trends are, you're going to know something. Well, the same thing with the boiler. That stack temperature gauge that's uh, on the back or the front of the uh, boiler, depending on if it's a three or four pass, we should be recording that temperature every time. And if we see that number getting hotter going up, that's telling us we're not transferring the heat through the tubes into the water where it's actually doing some good. It's going out into the atmosphere. And, and I'm going to also add here that we have a water side of the tube and we have a fire side of the tube. And just like your water side can be scaled, your fire side can be sooted. So as you're driving up to the plant, if you see black smoke coming out of your boiler, that is a severe problem in the, the oxygen gas content mixture. We don't mess with that. But there again, it's an indication that something's not firing right in that boiler. And so your service doesn't start when you walk in. Your service starts as you're driving up, looking around, because 
just like you're looking at the plume on a DA from the outside, you're looking at the stack on a boiler as you're coming in. And, and Trace, you're right. We know what the stack temperature normally is at a certain pressure of the boiler. And one of the nice things about a boiler, if it runs at 70 PSI in the winter, it's gonna run at 70 PSI in the summer. And, and so it, the stack temperature should always be fairly consistent. The only thing I will say is, is you do need to, to remember that if your boiler's on low fire and high fire, you're gonna have a little difference because That's on a great high point. fire, you're really pushing the gas through there. And uh, so your temperature will be a little higher. So normal operations, normal operations should be fairly consistent. But I will say that is if you know what's going on, then you should know what your, your results are going to be. That's a, that's a great point. And I like how you added the fact that, you know, we're treating the water side, but we may be the only conduit between communicating to that boiler and that customer that the fire side is actually sooted up and they need to take some action or it needs to be tuned up because that flame doesn't look right. Absolutely. Our second question is, how do you know if you've had a softener upset? And I'm assuming the softener upset means that sometime before you were on site that the softener was letting hard water go through the boiler. So your sample is showing a, a soft boiler. Yeah, right here okay. at, this, at this point in time, you're, you've got a soft water sample. But how do you know it's always been soft? And, and Trace, that's a great question because every test we perform is Right now, at this time, at this moment in time, these are our results. And what we're having to do is to assume what our values have been continuously. So your softener is soft. However, you know, you're going to test your feed water. If your feed water has any hint of hardness. Now, here's the thing. If, if your softener passed hard water and your hardness in your feed water or your DA tank is is, is high or very consistent with what your feed water or your soft water is, that's a good indication it just passed hardness. If it's, if it's a lot lower, it's either a lot of return condensate or it may have been a little while. But your feed water tank, your deaerator heater, is a dilution of your softener and your condensate sample. So any hardness in your feed water tank either came from your softener over the last period of time or from your condensate. So that's a great way to, to, to check a little longer period is by testing your feed water. Okay. How would you be getting hardness in your condensate? Uh, you got process leaks. If you've got a heat exchanger that, that heats up water and there's a leak is your biggest way from bringing back hardness. All right. And then you would just backtrack the condensate lines that you figured out where that source was. You, you know, you're going to go from there and notice if okay. you've got problems with condensate, then you're going to start saying, okay, uh, I've got a condensate receiver here, there, there, and there. I've got one of my hospitals have six different condensate receivers and I can go there and, and I can narrow it down. And then from there, I go to where those condensate samples come from. Well, there you go. So that doesn't specifically answer this question, but it's a great troubleshooting technique for if you are finding hardness in your feed water DA, where it's coming from. All right. So let's say this person is running their tests. Okay. And they've, they've run the hardness test and it's soft. They've run the feed water test and it's soft. And we still don't know if, if it's been soft uh, for a long period of time because all that water in the tank might have just gone to the boiler. So what can they run or how can they tell from other tests that they're running that they are maybe having some hardness leak through before a regeneration period? If you are running a... Uh, phosphate program, then your water may be cloudy or turbid. However, a lot of programs today are, are all polymer programs and etc. And so one of the things that I've noticed is when I run my alkalinity test, my P alkalinity will perform as, as natural or as normal. And then when I run my total alkalinity, the, the sample will go from green, a little brownish, brackish before it finally turns to the pink or purple. And if I let that sample sit, and it goes back to brown or back to green, what we're doing is the calcium carbonate is joined together. And by adding alkalinity titrant or sulfuric acid, I've redissolved that calcium carbonate, which has elevated the pH back above the point, but back above that 4.3. And, and it's raised my pH, so it changes the color back. Add a few more drops of the alkalinity titrant, it goes back pink and stays pink. So therefore I know that I have passed some hardness and those reactions that need to take place have taken place. Yeah, Mark, I love that answer because that shows that you are not just simply running the test and getting a result. You understand, one, the chemistry of the tests, 
what's going on. And by not doing anything extra, you're realizing what's going on because you understand that test. Absolutely. You know, another thing that I've picked up on is if you have had a softener upset, you will notice that your alkalinity will decrease. And if you look at your trends, you'll see that the alkalinity is perfect. It's exactly where it needs to be. And then all of a sudden it started dipping. And normally, if everything else is equal, normally that points back to you're getting some hard water in between that softener regeneration. I'll even throw one more example out there for you because I'm kind, kind I'm nice and stuff like that. What I've noticed also is your pH of your condensate drops a little. And the reason for that is the, is the heat will break down the calcium carbonate and release more carbonate back into your steam system, which would require more amine to neutralize it when it uh, condenses back to, to, to condensate. So, um, so if you got a funky color, if you've got in your alkalinities or if you've got low pHs in your condensate and everything else seems to be normal, it may be a softener problem. I, you know, we, we talked a lot around knowing your test from this question, and uh, I think it just goes to show the more you understand the tools that you are using and what they're doing to get their result, the more information they're going to tell you. So whoever, whoever wrote that question in, thank you for writing that in. It allowed us to have this discussion. Next question, what is the difference between a separator and a sand filter? And I'm assuming they're talking about a, a cooling tower. I would I would assume the same, and you know the the biggest difference there between the two is a separator is going to spin the solids out where the solids uh, will fall toward the bottom of the uh, uh, like a Laco separator, to where a sand filter actually performs a a layer that the water has to pass through, and then you know there, there's a couple things that you got to understand. A separator will only filter down so far, sixty microns, I believe. Sixty microns, fifty, sixty microns is what I've heard. Uh, a, a sand filter uh, will normally get you down to somewhere in the five or less. Five or less. So depending upon how clean you want your water, how much space you've got, how much maintenance you want to do on the system. Um, but I will say, as, as important as it is to, to have the right filter, the other part of, of any filtration system in a cooling tower are your what they call sweeper jets. Mm -hmm. The purpose of a sweeper jet is to move as much water through across the basin of the cooling tower to to push any dirt and de, and debris. Isn't one of your words debris? Debris, yes. Debris. To push that debris into the middle of the tower. He's saying debris. So that it can be uh, sucked up through the suction lines of the filter. Um, so, um, and there's many different uh, configurations. I've seen uh, alternating lengths of the sweeper jet. So we push from the edge in a little bit, and then there's a longer jet to which we're going to pick up from there and push more to the middle. But you've got to push the, the debris from the, the basin of the cooling tower into the middle to where the suction is. Yeah, keep everything stirred keep up. Keep everything stirred up. You know, uh, uh, speaking of sweeper jets, something that we have seen, you know, it's not hard. Anybody can put sweeper jets on the end of some PVC, but at the beginning where those jets are, they're going to get the lion's share of the water volume. And then by the time it goes all the way to the end of that line, there's no flow. So uh, uh, Jay Farmer actually taught me this and we started doing this and recommending this, that you put valves right before each one of your sweeper jets and that way you can throttle each one so you're getting that constant flow through your entire basin. And just in case you don't know, uh, a sweeper jet is, is very similar to a Venturi. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all, you're all, we're talking about flow here. And, and what a sweeper jet will do is take, take one or two gallons per minute and by sucking water in from the, the sides, Venturi effect, it will take one gallon and turn it to five gallons. And you will have five gallons of flow pushing with only one gallon of pumping. And so that's the, that's the advantage of having a sweeper jet versus just a nozzle with a little sprayer on it spraying in. All right, let me go back to the original question. And um, I truly feel that a sand filter is more appropriate on a cooling tower than a separator because it does filter more out. And if you think about what our job is, is to keep the system clean 
And when we have upsets in the system, of course, this depends on how stressed your water is. But if we have more debris, if you will, even less than the, the 60 micron, that can create a nucleation site. So the cleaner we can get the water, the better we can treat that water. So if I'm given a choice, Trace, would you rather have a separator? Would you rather have a sand filter? I will always pick a sand filter, but the customer doesn't necessarily like those as much because there's a little more maintenance involved. Yeah, obviously a separator is better than nothing, but I truly feel that the sand filter is the best filter media for a cooling tower. And I would agree. All right, so our last question is, uh, is a sock filter or a pleated filter better on a closed loop system? The, well, the two things you're looking for here is you're looking for uh, coverage area, surface area, and micron size. And so with, with those two, um, you know, which one is better? Whichever one you have is what I'm going to say. Some of the factors that you're going to take in place is, is, is what's available. You know, can I, can I step it down? Can I get a 25 micron filter, a 5 micron filter down to a 1 micron filter? If those socks are available, great. And if you have a sock filter uh, feeder, um, then that's great. If you don't, can you just put in a canister? If you already have a shot feeder, uh, maybe your customer will just buy a, a canister to hold a pleated filter. I mean, sometimes it does come down to cost to, to put in a sock fi filter. You've got to buy a filter feeder. You're looking at a cost of somewhere around 700, 800 bucks to, to buy that, that filter feeder. If you're looking for just a cartridge housing, you're talking about a hundred bucks. So, so it is cost, it's, it's surface area, it's how often, you know, you want to change these things, how quick you want to clean something up, how much surface area. But any filter is better than no filter, but it comes down to what's available and what you, you have on your system. Well, Mark, I definitely know how you feel when you were talking in our earlier segment where you're putting your arms up and down and waving and say, but Mark, you didn't talk about this and you didn't talk about that. So I'm going to do that exactly like you were doing to me. My arms were waving up and down. You guys can't see that. So that being said, I wholeheartedly think that the bag filter is hands down the best filter to put in a closed loop system. I'm going to tell you why. One, it is such a great show and tell. All the particles get caught in that bag filter. You can pull that sucker out and you can show the customer, I, I, I asked you to invest money, to trust me and invest money in this filter. Look at what's coming out of your system. Look what we don't have to contend with anymore that we've filtered out. So that's one of the good reasons. Another one is the pleated filter I absolutely hate. Um, I think they work great in pools, but I, I think they even have limitations in pools. As they start clogging up, they start folding in on themselves. And you mentioned that surface area is so important. Well, when they start collapsing in on themselves, they start losing their surface area. So I never use a pleated filter. If, if, the, if the device they have only takes the pleated filter and not a bag filter, what I will do is I'll get them a spun, a solid core filter, because those are never going to lose their surface area because they can't compress anywhere. And they might be a little bit more than a pleated filter, but you're going to get some more mileage out of them. But I got to say, there's just something to pull that dirty filter out when it's a bag filter and show them all the stuff that's in there. And well, I think they're the cheapest of all well, the filters. Well, maybe your systems are just a lot more dirtier than mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I, was, I guess I deserve that. Well, well, Mark, was this a better pinks and blues? Did you feel better about this one? You know, Trace, I think this has to be one of the best pinks and blues <laughs> episodes that, that's ever been presented on Scaling Up. And I, and I hope that you have many more just like this one. Well, Trace, I know that I kind of stole the show from you, and uh, well, this is uh, fun. I, I enjoyed ask it. questions, and so, uh, but thank you for allowing me to to steal your show. But I, I do think that sometimes people need to hear the Trace Blackmore and who he is, and what he is, and what he's thinking, and why he's thinking to under fully understand this show. And so that's why I kind of took over. So uh, I want to thank you for being on the show today, being my <laughs> partner, and. Uh, and maybe one day you'll be invited back on the show as a guest. Well, I hope so. I can only hope so. And thanks, thanks for having me on the show, Mark. Thanks. Well, folks, that was definitely interesting. I've never been a guest on my own show before. I will say it was great to have another opinion on pinks and blues. And I think this leads to something I think everybody knows already. 
Uh, but I'll say it anyway. I do the best job I can to understand the questions that you submit to me with the information that you give me with those questions, but that's all I have. If there is a huge issue, then I'm hoping that you're reaching out to me directly and let me know that you're, you really need some extra help on something, and then maybe we move to a more advanced uh, consultative type approach. But that being said, please don't take pinks and blues as I'm doing consulting work. I'm just giving you my opinion on things that are going on, and it was so good to have a second opinion on pinks and blues and Mark Lewis gave us, of course, his opinion, which he never has any issue doing. That being said, I have had people contact me directly, either via email or phone dialogue, or even had had me come on site when they've had other issues. Now, when they do that, I'm able to ask them so many more questions so we're just not looking at the surface of that issue. We're making sure we get down deep into the roots of that problem. And since Mark mentioned this on Pinks and Blues, it got me thinking. Many of us out there in the Scaling Up Nation have never had the opportunity to work with a consultant to help find a solution to a problem that they were having. And a lot of people are intimidated by that because they think, oh my goodness, if I'm not perfect, somebody's going to come and steal my business. So I thought, based on Mark's revealing of this, that it might be a great show to have, to have one of the people that I've worked with come on the show and tell you about the process. And it's not that I want you to hire me, but I want you to start thinking that the water treatment community is just that. We are a water treatment community, and most of us have no issues helping each other. And I know that's hard to believe. Everybody thinks that they're out for themselves. But those people that are truly invested in the water treatment community, they want to make sure that the water treatment community is the best that it can be. So I'm going to try to arrange that for you, Nation. I'm going to try to make sure that I get one of the people that I've worked with on the show so you can see what that process is like. And it might allow you to contact somebody that you know and ask them questions more freely. Producing this show has really turned into something I look forward to week after week, especially when I hear from members in the Scaling Up Nation or when they come to events like the AWT Technical Training and they tell me how much they look forward to every other week when this show comes out. When they tell me how much this show has helped them on a particular issue, or when they tell me what their favorite show is, or they tell me that this show has been that slight push to make them better in this industry. And since I started the CWT Challenge, I have heard from over a 100 people that have told me that they are committed to getting their CWTs. Folks, that is the very reason that I started this program, and I am so glad that you are taking advantage of it like I hoped that you would. So folks out there in the Scaling Up Nation, I want to thank you for listening to today's episode, and I can't wait to talk with you again next time on Scaling Up.